At 240 Tutoring, we've been helping teachers pass their exams and get in the classroom for years. However, Cecilia's review blew us away. She wrote to tell us that in just one month of studying, we were a game changer on her path to success. Are you in a similar position? Would a trusted roadmap and test aligned materials help you accomplish your goals? If so, you're in the right place. My name is Emma and I've helped thousands of teachers pass the Praxis exams. And today, I'm here to help you. This video is going to prepare you for the Praxis Mathematics Content Knowledge Grades 7 through 12 test. That's test code 5161. This video is going to cover three things. What's on the test and how to study for it, the most likely concepts that you'll need to know, and we're going to look at a few practice questions. Whether you're already a math expert or you need to brush up on a few things, we've got what you need. Now, the grades 7 through 12 math exam consists of two areas or categories. The first is number and quantity algebra functions and calculus, and the second is geometry, probability, and statistics, and discrete mathematics. Ugh, seriously, do you see what they did there? Sure, there are only two categories, but they shoved a ton into each of them. Let's do some creative rearranging. We'll leave the category numbers in place, but we'll make each topic a subcategory. There, this looks much better. Let's take a deeper look at each of these subcategories. Oh, I almost forgot to give you some good news. While the math is pretty tricky on this test, an on-screen graphing calculator is provided. The first category as a whole is worth about 68% of your exam, which will be about 41 questions. Starting with number and quantity, you're going to need to know how to deal with fractions, decimals, percents, and exponents. Plus, you need to be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide each of those in the right order. So think of this subcategory as the set of skills that gets us prepped and ready for everything else we need to do in this exam. We're going to pick out one thing from every subcategory to dive a little deeper on. And while it may seem basic, you're going to need to know the order of operations here. Remember PEMDAS? That whole, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally thing? You're gonna need to know what order to do specific operations in so that you can solve the problem to get the correct answer. So for example, you might be given a problem and need to use the order of operations to solve for the correct answer. Trying to solve the problem without using the order of operations would leave you with the wrong answer, so it's all about knowing which step to do first. Moving on to our second subcategory, algebra. You may already know what's coming here. Find X. Find X over here, find X over there, find X everywhere. But let's break this part down a little further. You need to be able to deal with algebraic expressions. Can you write them and can you simplify them? Then we take it up a few notches. Can you identify and graph a linear expression? How about if there's more than one variable? Can you solve a system of equations or inequalities? And can you identify the rate of change? Whew, am I the only one sweating here? I know it's a lot, but that's what the 240 study guide is for. It helps you work through all that X drama. You guys know I mean the variable X, right? Not your EX drama. I'm staying out of that one. You'll need to be able to move terms within an equation from one side of the equal or inequality sign to the other to solve for the value of a variable. You may even need to solve for multiple variables within a set of equations. For example, here's a system of equations where we need to solve for both X and Y. First, we stack the equations and add them vertically to eliminate one variable. Then we solve for the remaining variable, in this case, y. Finally, we take that value and substitute it in to find x. Let's keep this sweat sesh moving on to functions. You'll need to know what a function is and how to find the domain and range. You'll need to be able to graph and model functions and differentiate between the types of functions. You'll need to know the unit circle and even be able to rock and roll through trigonometric functions. Man, try saying that five times fast. Trigonometric functions, trigon trigon trigonometric. Ugh, I can't. Let's just start with the most important part here. What exactly is a function? A function is a special type of relation where each input has only one output. For example, here are three relations. The x values are the inputs, and the y values are the outputs. Let's look at set A first. This is a function because each number on the left is connected to only one number on the right. For set B, the number 2 on the left is connected to both 3 and 4 on the right. So set B is not a function. Finally, in set C, each number on the left is only pointed to the number 2 on the right. So this is a function too. Last stop in category 1, calculus. Biggest thing here, limits. And don't worry, you don't have to wear pink on Wednesdays for us to help you and the mathletes figure out when the limit does not exist. 
you're going to need to understand the meaning of a limit of a function, the derivative of a function as a limit, and whether a function is continuous. You'll also need to know how to calculate standard deviation, how to apply derivatives, and all about the foundational theorems of calculus. Whew, I'm really feeling that sweat build up again over here. How about I take a breather and have one of our amazing tutors walk you through a calculus concept? Let me introduce Salwa. She's going to help you understand standard deviation. A normal distribution will have a mean and median approximately equal to each other. This means that the line down the center represents both the mean and the median. Each of these vertical lines separates one standard deviation of data from the next. About two-thirds of the data lies between plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. For example, the label negative one sigma at the bottom of the graph shows the cutoff for the data value that is one full standard deviation below the mean. Data within the four center sections represents about 95.4% of the data. The tails, one on the right and one on the left, represent the extreme values from the data set, which are just a tiny fraction of the data as a whole. Let's apply this to an example. If a set of data has a normal distribution with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation sigma equals 2, then one standard deviation below the mean is 8 and one above is 12. So we would expect 68.2% of the data to fall between the values of 8 and 12. We would also expect 95.4% of the data to fall between the values of 6 and 14. So remember, a normal distribution creates a symmetrical shape on either side of the mean, with about two-thirds of the data falling within plus or minus one standard deviation. Isn't she great? You can see a ton more videos by Salwa and the rest of our tutoring team within our study guide. Man, we're cruising. All of category one is done. Let's dive into category two, which will make up the remaining 32% of your exam, starting with geometry. In this subcategory, you're going to need to understand transformations in a plane, proofs, constructions, trigonometry and triangles, area and perimeter. Ooh, let's talk more about trig and triangles. Here's a tip. If you're struggling to remember your trig functions, just imagine climbing the biggest mountain you can think of. No, no, hear me out. When you climb a super big mountain, your feet will hurt. And what do you do when your feet hurt? You soak a toe, ah? Uh, yeah, get it? <laughs> okay, fine, but it's still a great mnemonic. If you're trying to figure out sine, you take measure of the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. That's the so part. If you're trying to solve for cosine, you take the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse, so C equals A over H is our K. And if you're trying to solve for tangent, you want opposite over adjacent, so that's the toe. Uh, you may be laughing at me now, but I bet you'll remember it come test time. We've only got two categories left before we get to all those practice questions, so be sure to stick around to the end of the video. Probability and statistics are up next. In this section, you're going to need to summarize, represent, interpret, and generally just deal with data. You'll need to know about linear regression models and how to evaluate different statistical processes. You'll also need to understand conditional probability and how to use simulations to construct experimental probability. Since conditional probability seems to come up a lot, let's look a little more closely at that. Conditional probability, also called a compound event, occurs when two or more simple events are performed together so that one event happens and so does another. So basically, we're leveling up on your standard probability. Instead of asking, what is the probability I'll roll a three on this die? You take it up a notch. What is the probability I'll roll a three, then roll a four on this die? These compound probability problems can either be independent or dependent. If the compound probability is independent, the outcome of the first event doesn't change the probability that the second event will occur. So when I roll a die once, no matter what the outcome, I still have the same chance of rolling any of the six numbers when I roll it a second time. To calculate the probability of an independent compound event, multiply the probability of an event A times the probability of event B. So the probability of rolling a 3 followed by a 4 is 1 in 36. But in a dependent conditional probability event, the result of the first event changes the probability of the second. 
So if I'm trying to pull two aces in a row from a deck of cards, I have a four out of 52, or one in 13 chance, of pulling an ace my first time. But once I pull that first ace, the odds change. Now there are only 51 cards in the deck, and only three of them are aces. To calculate the probability of a dependent compound event, multiply the probability of event A times the probability of event B after event A has happened. So the probability of pulling two aces in a row from a single deck is 1 in 221. If you want to practice some problems on your own, you need to check out our study guide. There's a link right below this video for you. Last subcategory before we do practice problems together, discrete mathematics. In this last section, you're going to need to understand the different types of sequences and equivalence reactions. You'll also need to know the difference between discrete and continuous representation, and to understand the basic terminology of logic problems. How about we look at a couple of sequence types? First up, you've got arithmetic sequences, and these are usually the easiest to figure out. They have a common difference between terms, meaning you add or subtract the same number every time you go from one term to the next. In this example, we add five to get from one term to the next. Then you've got geometric sequences. In these, you need to either multiply or divide by the same number to go from one term to the next. In this example, we multiply by three each time. Finally, we've got complex patterns. In a complex pattern, you're going to have to identify two separate patterns. So looking at this number sequence, six, two, seven, three, eight, and so on. To go from six to two, you have to subtract by four. Then when we go up to seven, you need to add five. And you go back and forth between those actions. Subtract four, add five, subtract four, add five, etc. And that's it. We made it through all the subcategories. Now that we've gone over some of the big concepts in our two areas, let's look at some practice questions to show you how those concepts can appear on the test. And if you want a lot of practice questions, you can click the free practice test below. At the end, you get a score report on how well you did on the test. And then you can subscribe to 240 and get all the practice questions you need to be 100% confident for the test. Did I mention the 240 study guide has a money back guarantee that you'll pass? Now for questions. Remember for the number and quantity category, I told you about how you'll need to remember the order of operations? Let's look at how that's reflected in a question. Simplify the expression, 82 minus 100 divided by 4 plus 6 times 12. As we start to run through PEMDAS, there are no parentheses or exponents in this expression, so we can skip those steps. Then we move on to multiplication and division from left to right. Finally, we can simplify the remaining addition and subtraction from left to right, meaning this is our best answer. One question down. Moving on to the algebra section. What is the solution to the system of equations? Negative 4x plus 3y equals negative 5. And y equals x minus 1. Substitution is the easiest method to use to solve this system because one equation has a variable that is isolated. So we can substitute in x minus 1 for y. Now our equation is negative 4x plus 3 times the quantity of x minus 1 equals negative 5. If we simplify, we end up with x equals 2. Then we substitute x into our second equation and y equals 1. So the correct answer is 2 comma 1. What about those function questions? What do those look like? Which of the following relations represent a function? So in order for a number set to be a function, there can only be one output for every input. Or in other words, the x value can't repeat. So looking at choice A, there are two zeros in the x column, so it is not a function. In the next choice, each plotted point has a different x value, so it is a function. Then we move on and see that the input of negative one is connected to both two and seven. This means it is not a function. Finally, choice D has no repeating x values, so it is a function. So choices A and C are not functions, but choices B and D are functions. And last stop in category one, calculus. Approximately what fraction of the population is within one standard deviation of the mean in a data set with a normal distribution? 68.2% of the population will be within one standard deviation of the mean. The closest benchmark fraction to this percentage is two thirds. So D is the best choice. Category one, done. Let's move into category two, starting with geometry. What is the measure of angle A? Since we're given the measure of the adjacent side and the hypotenuse, we can do the ka part of Sokotoa. The cosine of adjacent divided by hypotenuse, or cosine of eight divided by 16, simplifies to cosine of one half, which is 60 degrees. So C is correct. Ready for a probability question? 
Five cards are randomly chosen without replacement from an ordinary deck of 26 black and 26 red cards. What expression shows the probability that all five cards are red? The first time we pull a card, we have a 26 out of 52 chance of it being red. So right away we can eliminate choices C and D. When we go to pull our second card, the number of red cards and total cards in the deck has decreased. So now we have a 25 out of 51 chance of pulling a red card. Choice A is correct. Each time a card is drawn, the probability changes. Last up, discrete mathematics. Which of the sequences below is arithmetic? An arithmetic sequence is one where the same amount is added or subtracted from each term to the next. The only one here that meets this criteria is B. This sequence has a constant difference of four since each term is four more than the preceding term, making it an arithmetic sequence. Now that's just a taste of practice questions to give you an idea about how these concepts are assessed on the test. Link below for a free, full diagnostic test. Congratulations on finishing the video. If you found it helpful, give it a like or a comment. There's still plenty more to learn. Did you know that thousands of teachers have passed their Praxis exams using our guides? If you really want to make sure you're prepared for the Praxis Mathematics Content Knowledge Exam, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 Study Guide. It has hours of videos so you can watch and or listen while doing chores. It's test aligned so you know precisely what you need to study. And it has hundreds of practice questions so you can be sure you're ready. And it has the money back guarantee. So click the link below right now to get started. Thank you.